Dream of Consciousness Writing. What does it mean? How do you do it? Are there any benefits to doing it? And what are they? Today we're going to answer all these questions and help you completely understand the terms stream of consciousness as well as expressive writing. We're going to look at the foundations of the academic term expressive writing as well as give you clear guidelines and instructions to help you begin writing stream of consciousness today. So, so make sure to listen to the end of the video, which is when I'll be going over the strategies and the tools that I've adapted from the author Natalie Goldberg, and which I've been using to teach college writing for 20 years. And with these simple guidelines, you'll be able to begin stream of consciousness writing on your own immediately. So hello, beautiful people, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and clicking on the bell for notifications. This is the channel to learn about literature and life. <clears throat> So the first thing to understand is that stream of consciousness should be considered a subset of expressive writing overall. So I'm going to start the video by explaining what the term expressive writing means or where it comes from. Then after that, we'll be discussing the term stream of consciousness, uh, taking a small little digression into a refresher on the basics of the subconscious, how that relates to journal writing. And then at the end of the video, we'll be looking at the guidelines and the rules for stream of consciousness writing, which come from my all time favorite writing teacher, Natalie Goldberg. So again, stick through until the end, because that's where I'm going to explain exactly how you do stream of consciousness. And even if you're not one of my students, if you found this video on YouTube, then by the end, I'm going to explain exactly, um, I'm going to give you a suggestion about what type of journal to get. And then I'm going to give you the exact uh, idea for what to do with your very first um, your very first writing session. So you'll be all set. So let's dive right into it. So as you can see from the um, the slide here, uh, the term expressive writing is an academic term. Um, it comes from James Pennebaker, a psychology professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and was used by him to describe the writing activity activity that he had undergraduates perform in research experiments uh, that he first began doing in the 1980s. I think probably 1983 was the first, um, <clears throat> I want to say that was the very first uh, experiment that he began. And you can, so some of the information that I'm going to talk about in the first couple of slides, if you're interested, you can look um, more, Pennebaker's got a bunch of books and he's a wonderful researcher. He's a wonderful writer. He's wonderful in overall. Um, one of the books which explains best uh, about expressive writing is his book called Opening Up by Writing It Down. So you can learn more. This is just going to be a little very quick little summary of some of the information in the first couple of chapters. So um, so Pennebaker was, Pennebaker's not, I don't think he would consider himself a clinical psychologist. I think he thinks of himself as a social psychologist. But um, early in his career, in the 1980s, he had devised this experiment where he was interested in whether or not people can um, experience significant uh, therapeutic benefit from writing. So that's what um, ex that's where this whole research area came into play, mm -hmm. and that's why you know he's a psychologist, not an English professor. He's a psychologist, so he was interested in the tangible benefits, and that's why I wanted to talk about this first also because um, whether you're writing for me in a class uh, at the University of Alabama or whether you you know just found this video on the on YouTube and you're gonna do what I suggest at the end there are the reason why I love journal writing expressive writing uh, so much and I do it myself and make all of my students in every one of my classes do it is because there are tangible positive mental health benefits from it. So um, as it says there in the second bulleted item, his original experiment in the 1980s was kind of serendipitous. He kind of just stumbled across the idea. And um, then um, in the next few years, he kind of kept repeating it. And um, so what he did originally was, as it says here, he had students write and a many of the, so this is again, um, this is almost 40 years old, the you know, research into this, uh, the benefits of therapeutic writing, um, almost 40 years old. And um, a lot of times still today, when psychologists at different colleges and universities um, do research experiments, they use his original model, which was to have 
uh, you know, participants in the study. Um, they would write for a 15-minute session, and they would do it four days. And I think the very first one was four consecutive days. Now, by the way, that was not there wasn't some special magical thing about that. Um, he says in, in one of his books that that was just an accident. That was like what, there was a room that was open for four days. And so that was how he initially started the study. And since then, pe lots of people have been doing it that way. But there isn't something magical about doing it, you know, four times for 15 minutes. That was just how he originally started it. Anyway, um, so going back to the very first, um, you know, uh, experiment um, that he did, he had these students write. Um, originally, now he was interested in trauma and how people deal with trauma and recover from trauma. And so some of his earlier research was especially um, uh I think he was interested in his team was interested also in uh, sexual trauma, people who are uh, suffering from, you know, sexual uh, traumas. And um, so that was some of the uh, impetus in the earlier experiments that he was doing in the 80s. And then it also kind of changed into occupational, um, I guess you would call it like uh, people who, you know, people who had been fired. Um, he did a really interesting study with that in the late 80s, early 90s. But anyway, so the very first um, experiment that he had, um, he had students write for 15 minutes um, uh, doing basically kind of a stream of consciousness writing for four consecutive days. And then um, their, what the result was is really simple and kind of astounding, which is that he had permission from this college I don't think it was the University of Texas. I think he might have been at a different college that first um, time. I'm, I don't remember. Um, but he had, uh, the students had signed waivers so that the, the research team had access to their student health records. And the people who participated in this, who wrote, who did expressive writing, had a significant decrease in their visits to the student health center over the course of like six months or something like that. So um, r from right from the beginning, the experiment showed that doing expressive writing has uh, quantifiable health benefits. So now, as I said, um, his first experiment, I think, was in 1983, and then he began duplicating it. And as it says there at the top of the slide, since then, you know, that's almost 40 years ago, there have been liter literally hundreds of studies about expressive writing, about uh, writing therapy, that have been done across dozens of institutions. So, um, and the, uh, you know, over the course of these 40 years, um, one of the, several things we now know about expressive writing. There are plenty of long-term positive effects. Um, they even have done, and this was a while ago, I think this was uh, in the late 80s, maybe, or, or the early 90s, uh, he got the idea to test people's blood because when you test people's blood, um, you can find out how strong their immune system is, right? And so anyway, the um, overall information that we have now about all of these different studies is that when you do expressive writing, um, it, it there have been studies that show it strengthens the immune system, there's a qualitative and significant stress reduction, and then the better job placement, I think that came from a, I want to say it was a 1993 article that he published that Pennebaker published, which was really fascinating. Um, just briefly, what had happened was <clears throat> there was a company, I want to say it was in Dallas in the late 80s or early 90s, which had laid off um, 100 computer programmers. It's a big company. I don't know what the company is. He doesn't mention the name of the company in his books. But um, they had just now these were uh i think either all or mostly men you know this was uh the late 80s early 90s and they this big company had just laid off a hundred uh programmers now these were men who were the average age was 52. they had zero um knowledge that this was going to happen the company didn't say it was going to downsize or anything they hadn't done anything wrong the company was just downsizing and they cut a hundred people and it was kind of harsh the way they did it. Um, these people got <clears throat> called into their supervisor's office, and the supervisor just said, you're fired, we're downsizing. And then a security guard escorted them to their personal workspace where they 
you know, collected their belongings and then escorted them out of their place of employment. So it was rough psychologically, especially you think about that. You're, if the average age of these people getting fired was 52, you're not sort of emotionally flexible um, and prepared for that. So anyway, um, but um, several months after this happened, uh, somebody contacted Penna Baker and asked him to do some kind of experiment slash writing therapy. And so he had a portion of these men who were fired from their computer programming jobs, and he had them do an expressive writing experiment. I don't, I don't know if it was just the simple four-day one or if this one was a little bit longer. It was probably just the four days. And what happened was very, um, and they just wrote about, um, you know, how terrible the experience was, you know, what, how bad they felt about it, how angry they were. So it was a cathartic thing for them to write about that, which we'll talk in a few minutes about um, the reason maybe why expressive writing is psychologically beneficial. It's very much like talk therapy. Um, you're getting something off your chest in a real simple way. But anyway, um, so there was a significant um, statistical effect of the people, the people who had taken uh, part in the study, who had done the expressive writing, they got jobs at a much better rate than the people who were in the control group who also got fired but didn't get to participate in the expressive writing study. So all kinds of research about the benefits of expressive writing. So um, now we are going to be doing expressive writing in my class, the class that you're taking from me right now in spring of 2022. So <clears throat> this um, so this is kind of like a just a more easy to read guide to expressive writing, how we're going to be doing it. We're going to be journaling. Um, your journal should be a compost for the unbridled first thoughts that race through your mind. No one is going to read this journal but you. Uh, when we journal in class stream of consciousness, <clears throat> I will walk around the room and I'll check to see that everyone is writing and that you're writing stream of consciousness, but I won't stop to read your words. They're yours. So now in that, and I think maybe um, <clears throat> uh, in, in a few minutes um, toward the end of the slide uh, and the video, I'm going to be talking about the wonderful um, writer and writing teacher, Natalie Goldberg. Um, and I'm going to be talking about her book for just a moment, call, uh, her book called Writing Down the Bones, which was published in 1986. And it's the gold standard of creative journaling and creative nonfiction as well. And uh, I've used some of her language. Um, I use it explicitly um, in my guidelines for journaling at the end. And I think maybe even on this slide, uh, this is a slideshow that I've been doing live with students for, I've changed it over the years, but originally, I mean, uh, my first time in a classroom teaching college English was fall of 2001. So it's been 20 years that I've been doing this. So anyway, um, you see there this term stream of consciousness. So let's uh, dive into that and talk about that just a little bit. Stream of consciousness. <clears throat> um, we, you've all heard the term. Um, just so we're clear, it's uh, it was coined by the American psychologist William James. Um, you've also heard the term probably um, associated with Zen Buddhism, with meditation, um, with different famous novels, especially from the high modernist area era. Um, Ulysses by James Joyce, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Those are novels that were published. Uh, I want to say that Ulysses was published in 22 and Mrs. Dalloway is probably 1925. Um, so the term stream of consciousness is something that everyone has heard, no doubt. And I'm not going to give some fancy definition of it. It's, it, um, it's what you have already thought of, which is that stream of information and thoughts that's continually running through your mind. If you're awake, you've probably got a stream of consciousness dialogue oftentimes running through your head. Sometimes it's just thoughts. Oftentimes it's this dialogue that we don't have control over where we're arguing with our girlfriend or our mother or father or roommate if you're a college student or something like that. Um, so we all know what that stream of consciousness is. And like I said, it's operating 24 seven when we're awake, unless you know, you're some kind of a a Zen master or somebody who's, um, who's figured out a way to still your mind enough uh, so that it's not as bothersome. And I say bothersome because 
uh, you know, research has shown that um, so many of the thoughts that we think are, they're often debilitating, and they're things that we think could happen to us, which don't, which are not even remotely possibly going to happen to us. Probably if, you know, I had more time, we could talk a little bit about why that is. It comes from evolutionary biology. We've got the brains of, you know, hunter-gatherers, and, um, but we're not... <laughs> We're not hunter gatherers anymore, obviously. So we're uh, conditioned. Our brain is wired 100% in our nervous system to be looking for problems. And so, so becoming aware of um, just literally think about this for a moment. Think about what I'm going to say and just contemplate how it's true. As you gain control of your thoughts, as you gain control of your thoughts, you are then able to gain mental discipline and gain more control over your life. You're able to function better. You're able to think more highly of yourself. It's the basis for self-esteem. Now, I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm talking about having a um, an unbiased view of like how things are going for you, how you can conduct yourself through the day, what other people are thinking of you, whether or not it matters, those sorts of things. So. Anyway, that is, um, you know, part of the reason I think that why expressive writing and stream of consciousness writing is so, why there's so much research that says that it's, you know, beneficial for your mental health is because anything, whether it's journal writing, whether it's meditation, uh, and that could be religious meditation, it could be, you know, Buddhist meditation or Vipassana, it could be mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, but anything, or even you know, even uh, people who are into sort of new age things or new thought, I, new thought um, concepts. Anytime you're gaining more control over your thoughts, then you are going to be able to direct your life and be happier and more functional. So, anyway, um, so we know what stream of consciousness is. Um, that last, I want to talk for just a second about the last um, novel that I've got down there on the road by Jack Kerouac. Which so Ulysses and Mrs. Dalloway are not written stream of consciousness style. Joyce and Wolf, or especially Virginia Wolf, was a meticulous writer. Virginia Wolf would take, you know, days to perfect a paragraph. She's fair, she's an amazing uh, writer. Uh, but Ulysses and uh, Mrs. Dalloway are examples of novels in which we're looking at the stream of consciousness of characters. On the Road, however, by Jack Kerouac, is a novel that was written stream of consciousness. So just to kind of differentiate that. So uh, Kerouac's most famous novel is uh, the 1957 novel <clears throat> On the Road. And as it says there, which uh, helped precipitate the counterculture movement of the late 1960s, uh, the manuscript written in a stream of consciousness style and later edited. So this is just kind of interesting, and you've probably heard of Kerouac. When I teach English 210, American Literature 2. I always teach a little Kerouac. Sometimes I teach the entire novel. Um, but On the Road, so the way that he, the way that Kerouac wrote On the Road was completely stream of consciousness in his process. He literally, and if you're interested in this, you can of course, you know, just Google this and, and look at the images of the original manuscript. So what Kerouac did was <clears throat> um, he hung Basically, if you can imagine a, a paper towel roll, it's about the same thing, um, but it wasn't paper towels. It was, uh, I think, some kind of a teletype paper <clears throat> or something that he used that he got from the railroad or something because he worked occasionally on the railroad. But he hung something that's similar to a paper towel roll, but with regular paper, hung it down from the ceiling on, a, I think, a just like a wire coat hanger. And then, um, excuse me. And then he fed that into his typewriter so that he would never have to, you know, <laughs> take out the pages, you know, a single sheet piece of paper, but he could just keep it as a continual scroll going through the typewriter. Um, so that's how he wrote the novel on the road. I think he did it in about three weeks. He was using a lot of coffee and um, drugs, too. And uh, so you can look at the scroll that it's really interesting, but he wrote in the stream of consciousness style. And then he later edited it, and there's, you know, there's two, two versions of On the Road. There's the original one published in 1957, which is phenomenal, phenomenal. 
Um, and then there's uh, the, uh, I think, the unrevised one. And the, but there's not that much difference. Um, and uh, anyway, so stream of consciousness. It, uh, Kerouac used it actually in writing his novels. It was part of his process. Okay, so implicit in all of this discussion of stream of consciousness, I think, is the notion that we have different levels of our consciousness. Um, even just using the term stream of consciousness, you have to think for a moment, well, stream of, it takes a moment to be either intelligent or self-aware enough to even just contemplate what is stream of consciousness and then, you know, become aware of what that is and become aware of your own thoughts and what your brain is doing. Um, so, so I want to take a few moments to just talk about the subconscious just a little bit because, um, basically f for the reason that when we write stream of consciousness, what's happening once you get into a good groove, and this is why at the end of the video, um, I have these really strict guidelines about how you write stream of consciousness. We'll follow Natalie Goldberg's uh, rules, which are really simple. But when you follow them, then the writing process will bring things up from your subconscious. So let's just take a second to talk about the subconscious. Um, uh, Freud is the one, of course, who popularized the subconscious in the <clears throat> last decade of the 1800s and the first couple decades of the 1900s. Um, and, uh, and then I just, uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Freud. Um, the second item there, I have Freud's uh, tripartite system for breaking down the human mind into different aspects, the id, ego, and the superego. So um, even if that, um, that system that Freud, you know, originally uh, theorized 100 years ago, even if there's, you know, that's not necessarily very scientific, still the idea that we can conceptualize our minds, not our brain, but our mind, our thinking, um, the field of awareness maybe that we could say that is produced by our brain, we can easily, all of us, conceptualize how there could be different parts to it. And, you know, that's become really routine now in like pop psychology and things like that to think about the ego and the ego is getting in the way of things. And so regardless of whether or not that's scientific, it doesn't matter because it can be really helpful to think, oh, you know, maybe I'm maybe my ego is getting in the way a little bit of this thing, or maybe I need to detach a little bit from this sort of thing. So so um, so I think it's really interesting to just, you know, be aware we've got a subconscious and then just whether or not the, you know, the actual foundation from it, which came from Freud, is very scientific doesn't matter um, because what matters is the fact that you can, you know, use you can conceptualize the idea of breaking your mind down into different aspects. And if that can help you, if it can make you a happier person, if it can help you with your mental health issues, if it can help you with your goals in life, then it's, you know, wonderful. At the, the final um, item there, it says psychoanalysis and therapy. So um, obviously the first thing that uh, Freud is known for, which he developed with, I think, Joseph Breuer was um, his colleague's name, uh, was talking therapy. And that was radically new at the time. Of course, Freud uh, took it on, and then Carl Jung also became later uh, famous using it as well. But just, um, and I've heard uh, James Pennebaker, who I mentioned earlier, kind of talk about this before in some of the YouTube videos and interviews I've seen of him, that his, um, and it's really simple, um, so even if uh, contemporary, like if you go into a, a, a counselor right now, whether it's at a college student health center or it's a, you know, a private practice or something. If you go see a counselor right now, um, you're going to have some kind of therapy that's based on a talking cure. Now, it's not probably going to be strictly Freudian the way it was 100 years ago where they're, you know, going to have you lay on a couch and they're going to sit behind you and, you know, do sort of, um, I know, free association type things. But the whole, the foundation for what Freud brought to, you know, the world was the idea that um, as you, you know, talk about things and as you, a little bit of the free association is important because as you do that, you uncover things which are repressed in some way. And um, 
So his idea, of course, was that um, when we have traumatic ideas and incidents in our childhood, then our part of our mind uh, will sort of transmute that anxiety or problem into a neuroses or into some kind of issue. And that when you uncover that, um, then there's going to be obviously a therapeutic benefit to it. Now, again, I'm not trying to advocate for a 100-year-old talking cure by Freud, but as I said a few moments ago, even uh, Pennebaker has suggested that the reason that uh, stream of consciousness writing is therapeutic is because just like um, going to see a counselor, what you're doing is you're uncovering things that you didn't realize. And the way uh, James Pennebaker says it uh, is sort of in comparing um, talk therapy with expressive writing is that we it hurts us when we're keeping a secret. And especially if that if we're keeping that like from ourselves. So just to become aware of what's bothering us is really beneficial. So now we're going to shift gears here for a moment because we kind of got into some <clears throat> theoretical, you know, ideas with Freud um, in the last few moments. So I want to take a moment to just say, uh, as I've got on this slide here, and ask you, now think about this for a moment, what would be a simple argument in favor of the idea that all of us have subconscious thoughts and ideas? Now, when I teach this um, in class, uh, I literally pause and I go now, and I force my students to think about it and raise their hand, and we don't go on until a few, you know, wrestle with the idea and come up with it. So do that for just a moment right now. What if you were to, let's wipe away our knowledge of, you know, uh, Sigmund Freud and William James and <clears throat> any psychologist that we associate with the subconscious. Forget about that. And if I were to say, could you prove that you have a subconscious, that your mind can do things subconsciously or does things subconsciously, could you prove it? Think about that for a moment. Can you prove, can we prove that we have a subconscious? Now, I would say there, so I've got two sort of short answers for why that we do and why we can prove to ourselves that we have a subconscious. And so here's the first, which is just really simple. So think about dreams. Now, I'm not talking about in-depth understanding of your dreams or Freud's interpretation of dreams or anything like that. Although I, we might add momentarily that not only do some psychologists, but religions, uh, I think every major religion has at some point in their sacred scriptures, some incident where there's a revelation by God or by a deity to some, you know, person, whether it's, um, whether it's Noah in the Hebrew scriptures or something like that, or in, um, <clears throat> but there, there's for thousands of years, there has been a correlation between the idea that, that are the, not a correlation, but there's been the idea that our dreams are telling us something. So anyway, but more importantly, just think about it for a moment. You have dreams. You don't have control over them <clears throat> unless you're, you know, practicing Tibetan dream yoga, which most people probably aren't. <clears throat> but we have dreams. We have no control over them. That's proof. We have a subconscious. What's another thing, just really simply, that you know? Now think about this in kind of a broader scope. How do we know that our mind is subconsciously doing things or our brain is subconsciously doing things for us beneficial things well really simply all the things that um are taken care of by our brain and our you know autonomic nervous system uh nobody who's listening to this video right now is making a conscious effort to breathe or a conscious effort to circulate your blood um i like to play a little game in class sometimes when i'm discussing this and i say who here is ready for lunch? Or if it's a late class, who's ready for dinner? And somebody raises their hand and I say, okay, Jonathan, uh, where are you going to eat? Well, at the student uh, center, what are you going to eat? And they tell me and I say, now, Jonathan, um, are you making a conscious decision to you know, produce uh, enzymes in the lining of your stomach walls to break down that food right now? No, of course not. But when you know that you're going to eat <clears throat> in a little while, your body starts getting ready for it. There's, so there's all kinds of things that our body is doing. Obviously, you all know this subconsciously. So I think that's just kind of important because when I say that writing 
stream of consciousness is going to bring things out of our subconscious, I think it's important to realize that it's a fact. We have a subconscious. Our brain and our mind are doing things for us all the time. And also, just kind of on a side note, <clears throat> thinking about the subconscious and thinking about how often we do things in a repetitive, habitual way without thinking of them. If they're good things, then it's great. I mean, we don't want to think consciously about how to start the engine of a car or back out of a driveway or put on our shoes or you know, anything like that. We'd like to be able to do that on autopilot while we're talking or listening to something or whatever. But um, there's a really great um, book uh, by James Clear, fairly recent in the last few years, called um, Atomic Habits. And Clear, and he's not the only one, but to write about like becoming aware of our habits and then helping to mold our habits into more productive ones is really the key to achieving our goals. So... <clears throat> Okay, great. Well, so let's get into talking a little bit about writing specifically now. Um, so uh, when we do stream of consciousness writing in the classes that you're taking from me, I'm going to assign you a topic to begin your entry. And I expect, I always expect you to drift away from that topic as you do stream of consciousness writing. We're going to be doing stream of consciousness writing every single day in class we'll start with uh 12 minutes probably in the first not on the very first day but on our second day of class first day of class i always just go over the syllabus talk about the class calendar etc and on day two of any class you take from me we'll be doing stream of consciousness writing we'll do it every class period <clears throat> and then after spring break um, i'll also assign you to do a little stream of consciousness writing outside in a public setting or just outside of class now, here's the most important thing in this video if you are a current student of mine. And it's also the way I think that writing, stream of conscious writing, should be taught by anyone, whether it's a high school or a college teacher, <clears throat> which is that um, nobody should ever read your entries. Nobody should ever read your journal. If you've got a writing teacher who asks you to hand your journal in, that's wrong. That's not the way it should be done. Um, so in the classes that you're taking from me at the end of the semester, I'll check your journal and grade the amount of writing without reading it. Literally, it will take me a minute and a half and it'll be in your presence. Uh, we'll just uh, sit down at a little table together and you'll just kind of flip through to show me that you've done the amount of writing without ever giving the journal to me, without ever me reading it. And you'll get a grade based um, solely on the amount of writing you will never ever hand your journal in to me. I will never read your entries. Very, very important. So, <clears throat> so now let's get to the actual rules for writing stream of consciousness. Now, this is uh this comes from Natalie Goldberg. I'm gonna explain her book on the next slide, but really quickly, what are the rules? Hard and fast rules, not guidelines, not ideas, rules that you abide by. And those are really simple. Stream of consciousness writing means keep your hand moving. You don't cross out. You don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. So that's really important. As the first one says, you're not going to pause to reread the line. You're not allowed to, period. Um, you're not allowed to edit. You're not allowed to cross things out. Even if you write the wrong word or something, you just keep. That's what stream of consciousness writing means. You keep your hand moving the whole time. The first rule is the most important it's the golden rule you keep your hand moving you keep writing stream of consciousness and then um for some of you who are overachievers the reason you may have never written stream of consciousness style or the reason that it may feel difficult for you is because uh you like to worry about spelling punctuation or grammar but you're not allowed to do that you're writing you're going to keep your hand moving so now all of these rules for <clears throat> stream of consciousness writing come from natalie goldberg this is her book um, I want to say 1986 is when this book was originally published, Writing Down the Bones. So Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones. Um, the last slide, actually several slides in this video, um, I've used the language from her. I love Natalie Goldberg, and this book is, I think, one of the most important books on writing published, period, ever. It's phenomenal. And uh, I also have, well, I also sometimes will do writing exercises right from the book. Um, I make it a required book when I teach uh, creative writing classes, but I also just do some of the exercises with students in other classes as well. 
So Writing Down the Bones, one of the best books at explaining creative nonfiction writing, and also she gives you writing scenarios and prompts. Cannot recommend it highly enough. And again, as I said, um, some of the language on the previous slide and this next slide right here, this comes exactly from Goldberg's book. So, um, okay, so those three rules in the previous slide were how to write, those are the rules for sort of physically, and then these are what I would call the emotional rules for writing, um, which are lose control, don't think, don't get logical, go for the jugular. So, and again, this comes from Natalie Goldberg. If something comes up in your writing that is scary or naked, dive right into it. It probably has lots of energy. So that means when I assign prompt, when I, when I give a writing prompt, and then we do a 12-minute stream of consciousness uh, writing session or 15, or if you do them on your own, you do them for whatever amount of time. I do them for 30 minutes. Um, I got that from uh, Julia Cameron who uh, is also a wonderful writing teacher as well, Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way. <clears throat> but we're not ever going to do 30-minute writing sessions in my classes. Um, but as it says here, don't think, don't uh, get logical, lose control, go for the jugular. So that means you're required, and because you know that I'm never going to read it, you're never going to hand the journal in to me, you're never going to share it in any way ever, so that means as you get about two or three minutes into it, you're starting to write, and you're writing about whatever the writing prompts might be. You know, it could be something about literature. It could be something about John Donne or, you know, whoever we might be studying at the time. When your brain starts to go off in some other direction about problems with your roommate, whether or not your boyfriend or girlfriend is going to break up with you, uh, what your plans are for the weekend, you go into those things take yourself into those things and you write about those more private areas <clears throat> a you're required to be nobody ever reads the journal never handed into me so those with those things have um sort of uh to do about everything so great so again this comes from natalie goldberg as well these are the rules it's important to adhere to them because the aim is to burn through to first thoughts where energy is unobstructed by social politeness to the place where you are writing what your mind actually sees and feels, not what it thinks it should see or feel. And actually this is, you could kind of connect this in a way the way um, Goldberg is writing here. Goldberg is a Buddhist, and um, so her writing, you can kind of see, um, uh, she says it's a great opportunity to explore the oddities of your mind. Um, first thoughts have tremendous energy, and then there's one more uh, quotation from uh, Natalie Goldberg, the internal sensor usually squelches them. So we live in the realm of second and third thoughts, thoughts on thoughts, twice and three times removed from the direct connection of the first flesh, first fresh flash. First thoughts are also unencumbered by ego, that mechanism in us that tries to be in control. So this is really beautiful. This is where I think it's kind of cool to think about the intersection, if you will, of um, psychology and, you know, Buddhism. Um, what Natalie Goldberg is suggesting here is that when we write stream of consciousness style, we're getting rid of our ego and now not in the sense we're not worried about the sense of being a more ethical person or being more moral. We're getting rid of the part of us that's trying to control us. that's trying to make us conform. We are society is always, always from birth to death. Society is organized to get us to conform. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't some value in um, conforming occasionally and conforming perhaps for a certain period of time. Um, you're conforming when you take a college class. You're doing it for a good reason. You're hoping that you're going to you know, graduate, get a better job, have a better life, <clears throat> etc. So there's you know, value to understanding how to fit into society, but it's always at the expense of our individuality. So... Uh, when you write stream of consciousness, what you're doing is you're kind of uncovering things about yourself and things about your situation. It helps you to know what you really love, what pisses you off, what friends you want to get rid of. It's phenomenal. So um, great. Well, so we're winding down here. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to tell you is, first of all, so if you're taking a class from me, you're going to be required to get a composition style journal like that. Now, if you're just watching this video on YouTube and you're not taking a class from me, 
I strongly urge you when you begin journaling, I'm going to give you all the tools right now in the next 10 minutes to understand how to begin journaling and start doing it. I strongly urge you to get a real cheap composition style journal just like this. You can get them at Walmart. I think they cost 48 cents. I know for a fact that they cost less than a dollar and that one right there is from Walmart. So get one of those. Don't get a $30 one at Barnes and Noble. You don't need it and you're going to it's going to stymie you emotionally and artistically. Don't get it and Gold Natalie Goldberg says the exact same thing. She says she loves to get cheap uh, uh, journals because they um, help her to realize that it's, you know, she doesn't have to take herself too importantly. And she's a famous author. She's a great writer. So my, I strongly urge you to just get a cheap journal from Walmart. So now if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not taking a class from me, you can get one just like this. You don't have to get it at Walmart. You can get it. They have them at any grocery store. They even have them usually at CVS and Walgreens and things like that. But get one that's really inexpensive um, that just costs a dollar or two like that. Cardboard bound, non-spiral. Make sure you get that it's got lines in it because if you get it at, uh, for example, the soup store at the student center, <clears throat> they have blank pages for artists and you don't want those. You want lines, whether it's college ruled or wide ruled, doesn't matter. But get a cheap journal. Now, if you're watching this and you're not one of my students, go get one, pause the video, and then, um, you know, come back to it in a day or two when you have your journal. So, all right. Now, um, <clears throat> I am going to explain what the very first writing prompt should be when you're learning stream of consciousness writing. And so, now, if you're one of my students, then you can just, you'll just watch this for the next few minutes. You're not going to do any writing. Um outside of class yet. So I'm just going to explain this to you. If you're one of my current students, you can just kind of think about these things, but don't do any of the writing yet. You're going to do it all in class on the second day of class. So <clears throat> now if you've paused the video and you're somebody else and you went and got a journal and uh, come back, what you're going to do for the, your very first writing prompt is very simple. Turn to your first page or turn to your second page if you want to. Write the date at the top and then don't do this stream of consciousness. Do this quickly, but don't overthink it. And what you're going to do is you're just going to write out three or four, if you're a student, uh, you're going to write out three or four academic goals. If you're not a college student, uh, then you can just write out three or four professional goals, like things you want to do better about work, maybe getting a better job, working for a promotion, something like that. Just list them out. You don't have to write them out fancy. They could just be a little bulleted list. <clears throat> if you're a college student, you can think about what is your most important class, what kind of GPA do you need. Maybe you can also think not just about your classes, but also other things that you can do for academic and professional goals. Like maybe you're in the Greek system, and one of your goals is to, within the next year, get a leadership role in your sorority or something like that. <clears throat> so you're going to make a list of three or four of those things, and then just skip down a line. And again, if you're one of my current students, you're not going to do this on your own. You're going to do it in uh, the, you're going to do it in the second day of class. So you can just think about these things for now. Um, then you're going to skip down a line and you're going to write three or four personal goals. So these could be things about, they could be things about your health. They could be things about fitness. Uh, they can be like kind of, you know, New Year's resolutions type things. They can also be things about how you show up in the world, who you are. You can think about things which are more abstract, but maybe more meaningful, like um, not just things like, oh, I want a boyfriend or I want a girlfriend, but things like, I want to be more confident. I want to I have better habits as far as like sleep and like getting up early. And I want to, you know, take things a little bit more seriously in life, something like that. Um, they could be creative things like, um, I want to spend less time on my iPhone and I want to, you know, devote a certain amount of time per day to, uh, it could be anything. It could be learning to program. It could be um, writing. It could be something artistic. You probably loved to draw when you were a kid and that got, um, you know, squashed out of you at some point in uh, public education, unfortunately. So um, again, those are just uh, some goals that you can think about now. And again, if you're one of my current students, you're not going to do this writing now, but I'm going to go ahead and tell um, you now. And again, if you've kind of stumbled upon this in on YouTube, what you want to do is pause this now, 
you've made sure you've gotten a cheap, you know, inexpensive journal like this, get one at Walmart, get one at any place, and then write down those things. And then I'm going to give you a writing prompt right now. And you can, if you are not one of my students, um, you can use this as a writing prompt. You're going to write down a list of goals, three or four things that you maybe are interested in your career or if you're any type of student, and then three or four goals that have things to do with your health or your relationships or just your life in general or creative things, list those. And then what you're going to want to do, remember the, we'll go back to Natalie Goldberg's um, rules. These are rules. They're hard and fast. Even though free writing and stream of consciousness writing sounds kind of new age and crazy and artistic and poetic and everything, if you use these rules, then that's the discipline that allows you to get to be a creative person. And I'm positive about that. So then once you've written down your goals, <clears throat> you're going to remember these things. Keep your hand moving. Don't cross out. Don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. You're going to give yourself a nice short time period. I would suggest 12 to 15 minutes. Trying to go over 15 minutes is going to be a little bit rough for the first time, but 12 to 15 minutes is good. Set yourself a little timer. And then, and I'll give you a writing prompt right now. And then what you're going to do is you're going to write stream of consciousness on that. And again, if you're one of my students, you're not going to do this writing on your own. We're going to do this exact exercise in class, literally on the second day of class. So <clears throat> once you have that list of um, goals, then here is what you would do. And, uh, you know, you can probably... You, just remember what this prompt is or you can close out YouTube and then, um, you know, get get yourself in the headspace so that you are going to follow the rules that Natalie Goldberg suggests, which I live and die by, which are to keep your hand moving. Don't worry about spelling, punctuation or grammar. Don't cross things out. Keep that hand moving. And then here would be the writing prompt for you. Think about all those different goals you have. And now here's your writing prompt and you just dive right into this and go for at least 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, set your timer on that. And then here is your, your prompt. What is your single most important goal and how can you work toward that on a daily basis? Good. So, uh, so you can remember that again, you can easily obviously pause this, but when you're doing stream of consciousness writing, what you want to do is kind of, you know, get yourself in the right space. Surprisingly, it's actually easy to do it in a, uh, like a public place, you know, like a Starbucks or a coffee shop or anything like that. In Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, she talks about, and I agree with her, I completely agree with her, she talks about how fun it is to do stream of consciousness writing in public places. You know, this is published in 1986, so she doesn't talk about Starbucks. She talks about little mom and pop coffee shops and places like that. Um, but it's true. You like you can sit down, even if it's at a busy Starbucks, you sit down and um, if you needed to, you could put headphones on with some ambient music or classical music or something like that so that people don't bother you. And then, um, boom, set a little timer. You go for 12 minutes. Keep that hand moving. You allow yourself to go wherever it needs to be. Remember these rules for the uh, sort of emotional subject matter, which are to allow yourself to go off on tangents. If you're a college student and I, you know, tell you to write about your goals, but your parents are getting divorced and you just learned about it over Christmas break. Well, two minutes into your writing session, I guarantee you're going to be writing about your parents getting divorced or your boyfriend just dumped you or your girlfriend just cheated on you or your new roommate is, you know, horrible, something like that. You're going to shift gears. And what you want to do is just shift gears for sure. That's the best way to do it. So again, let me repeat that writing prompt for you. So you now with this video, you've got all the tools you need. You understood where stream of consciousness comes from, how it's a subset of expressive writing in general. And now you know the rules, which come from Natalie Goldberg, the queen of journal writing. And uh, then I've given you a nice little set of um, just a little listing exercise to do. And then the writing prompt is after you think about all those different goals, you just boom, 12 to 15 minutes on what is your single most important goal out of all of those and how can you work toward it on a daily basis? Wonderful.
Well, that's going to conclude this video. And if you're one of my students, uh, again, we'll be doing those writing exercises. We'll be doing that writing exercise in class. So the only thing you have to do for day two of school is to bring a composition style journal. And if you're somebody who has found this video on YouTube, you're lucky because stream of consciousness writing is wonderful. And it's just, it's a weird thing. You, most people don't know how to do it or why to do it or anything like that. But now you know all those things. So uh, I didn't know it was my senior year in college as an English major at the University of Iowa. <clears throat> and uh, I was taking a nonfiction writing class. And uh, the book that I chose, I had a really great teacher and she told us, go to the bookstore, go to Prairie Lights Bookstore in downtown Iowa City, find a book about writing and that'll be your textbook. It's the coolest way to teach a writing class. Um, and so the book that I happened to randomly, 100% randomly, um, that I used was Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, which is a classic book about creativity and writing and something that I would strongly encourage you to look into, Julia Cameron's <clears throat> book The Artist's Way. But anyway, that's how I got into a stream of consciousness writing is because um, I was following the writing rules in Julia Cameron's book, but I was doing it for a class I was taking. So, all righty, and uh, we'll, maybe not immediately, but at some point in the future, uh, I'll be putting up more videos about writing um, for the spring of 2022, and probably in the summer, I'm going to be doing more British literature, but at some point, I'm going to be getting to more uh, creative writing videos. So, thank you uh, for being here, and... Um, that is going to be the end of this video.